welcome to episode 187 of the Campus Comics Cast, where we will start by wrapping up episode 186 before beginning 187. I'm Scott Reed. You can find me at bergcomics.com. That's B U R G comics.com. Mike, where would people reach out to you if they wanted to track you down? Well, that would be at Mike at Mike's Comic Shop Roadshow. Dot com. All right. And Shad, what about you? Uh, you can find me at shadschubert.com. Oh, okay. And what do we have coming up on episode 187? Oh, on 187, well, we're going to do the first five of Deathstroke, and we're going to do the Galactus trilogy for Fantastic Four. All right, great. Well, hey, why don't we just do that <laughs> right now? But first, before we do that, I did get to spend the weekend in Metropolis, Illinois, at the Superman celebration this year. I was actually set up selling comic books there. I'd run this little thing called the Metropolis Supercon. and But while I was there, I got to meet uh, Carl Kiesel. Um, I got to meet uh, Zach Howard. I got to spend a little bit of time with, uh, with them, along with uh, Mark Spears and another comic pro, Jim Hall. So that was kind of a fun time. Now, Mike, you made it down there too for a little while as well. So what all what all did you experience down at uh, Metropolis while you were there? I well, I I almost didn't make it because I got in like at three in the morning the night before from uh, a work trip. But I was determined to get there for the first time in my many years, and it was uh, I was not disappointed at all. I I found it to be very. It was nice in such a way that uh, one is, you know, likes a, uh, a county fair or a, a picnic in your town, a small town picnic, but with the added feature of comics and comic pros and cosplay and things like that. So it was like, I mean, it was my uh, dream come true for like a, like that kind of a picnic deal. So, I mean, I, you could get a burger or a brat or a candy, mm -hmm. cotton candy or whatever, but at the same time you could go shop for comics and I've, I found uh, some good vendors there um, and I went over to the building where the the Artist, uh, it Alley. Was Artist Alley and Writer's Way and mm -hmm. I got to talk to Carl Kiesel for a pretty good amount of time. We had a really good conversation. Um, he didn't know I was kind of explaining given uh, the bearings of where I'm from and he wasn't aware that where I'm from, Chester, Illinois, is the home of Popeye, so he was quite interested in that. So uh, I didn't get to meet Mark Spears; he wasn't at his booth, but ah. and I was, you know, I, I was only inside that building maybe for 45 minutes. But I did make some purchases. I got some autographs. Uh, or I just, just you know, what, things that you, you need to do to support uh, the creators and things like that. So okay. I, I wish I would have gotten something like what you got. <laughs> but I'll leave that to you to talk about. <laughs> All right, so I also, so I was there selling most of the time. So um, where I was selling at, we started at noon on Friday. So I was there at Artist Alley at 10 a.m. as soon as they technically opened up the doors. Uh, so I can make sure that I could get in there, talk to a few people. And I got concerned because when I got there, uh, Carl Kiesel wasn't there. And it's like, oh, no, because he was like the main guy uh, that I wanted to go talk to. So it's like, well, okay, well, I'll go catch a couple of these other people here real quick so i went over and uh, a guy named zach howard he's a, a penciler he's done a, a lot of projects he worked on superman in the past but uh, the big reason i wanted to talk to him was because he had done a variant cover for idw uh for rom number one and even though this is an audio podcast i'm holding this up for our video so <laughs> i was able to get a uh get a commission from him for uh, Rom, got that set up. Talked to him a little bit. He's going to be working on. He works a lot with Mike Mignola, mm -hmm. so he's apparently a, uh, Mike Mignola's favorite Hellboy story is the Crooked Man. Okay. And yeah. uh, the Crooked Man was originally uh, drawn by Richard Corbin, who has since passed. Mm -hmm. So now Zach Howard is going to be illustrating the sequel to Mignola's favorite uh, Hellboy story. Cricket, so he's going to do the sequel to The Cricket Man, which nice. I thought was awesome. And then the other cool thing that happened is Sunday night, a lot of times these creators, they're, they're, they're head into a plane sometime Sunday afternoon. Well, for whatever reason, uh, Zach Howard wasn't going until uh, Monday morning. So I actually got to go out and eat uh, with Zach Howard Sunday evening before I left Metropolis. So there was a restaurant in town called Fat Ed's. And uh, I've seen we went it. there, and uh, we went there, and uh, uh, he is uh, Zach Howard is though primarily vegan, so he had to have a, a bean burger oh. 
but uh, he had a bean burger. I had a bourbon chicken. Uh, a couple of other people were with us. A, a good, a good friend of mine named Corey Toon was there. He also sells and deals comics, and and uh, his wife came along. So that was really, really fun. And then, uh, but going over, I then got to talk to uh, Mark Spears for a little bit. He was at my show last year. Um, and he actually, after he left my show, is when he went to the Superman Museum and talked to them. And that's kind of how he got uh, got set up to be at the Superman Celebration this year. So that was that was pretty cool. And then, by that point, Carl Kiesel had managed to show up before I had to leave. So I was like, yes. <laughs> So, and I got to, I got to embarrass myself. So like I, I immediately stood by his table and said, I'm going to turn the other way. I know you just walked in the door. So you tell me when you're ready. So I, so I didn't want to like pressure you to feel like you had to rush to talk to me. So I went and uh, just kind of stood there and then I got out my, he finally said, okay, I'm ready to go. So I got out my books and I said, I introduced and said, you know, Hey, I, I, uh, I have to embarrass myself a little bit. I said, I had no idea before this week that you were an inker and an illustrator. I had only known about his writing credentials. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I usually, when I hear about a creator coming to area, I'll jump online, I'll try to figure out what do I have in my collection mm -hmm. that I can then go ahead and take down and get signed. So that's whenever I discovered that he basically started as an inker and he's done illustrating as well. So the to my delight, really, I did not realize that that one of my it's for sure one of my top 20 favorite comics of all time and maybe my one of my in my top 10 but the legion of substitute heroes special <laughs> he inked that cover so first book i pull out is that i ask him to sign that and then i had somehow there was this very late jack kirby project called oh gosh i don't have it here right now it's i think it was something like galactic heroes but he also had inked over the top of Jack Kirby yeah. on the cover of this other book. So I had that book signed. And then I had brought with me a blank cover for Legion of Superheroes, which was the Bendis series. But I thought, <clears throat> I said, so are you going to be doing any sketches this weekend? And, I, you know, and this is after me telling him I didn't even realize he was an artist. <laughs> 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 and he said, he said, no, nah, I hadn't planned on it. It's like, I said, look, I will take something, just a real quick thing. It can be a marker sketch. Cause he, he kind of said, I didn't even bring any pencils with me. And it's like, it's it's okay. You know, I'll take a marker sketch, anything, because I may not get a chance to meet you again. So I'd, I'd really, really appreciate it. And he finally said he would, though he wouldn't take any money from me right then to kind of cement it. <laughs> so that way he kind of had to do it. I said you got till Sunday. You can you can work on it, whatever. Because I will I will be here Sunday, and uh, no rush. And if you do decide to do other commissions, you can put mine on the back burner, whatever it takes. So I got uh, so then I went running back to where I was set up so I could start selling stuff. Well, then I realized that whatever he set up, he had not taken any. He not brought anything because he lives I think on the West Coast. Mm. So they flew him in. So of course they. And I'm sorry, this story is going so long. But no, it's so great. Like they, they flew him in, right? So I, obviously he didn't want to carry in his luggage, you know, comic books just to, you know, sell or whatever. So he didn't really bring anything. So and of course at these things, people will show up, have no idea who a lot of these creators are because, well, it's mostly like you said, a, a town festival. So it's just like, well, they go down there. They don't know who Carl Kiesel or Mark Spears is. They're there for Brandon Ralph and right whoever it was from Smallville and whatever, right? So um, I had, uh, before, I had initially planned on uh, having these books out on my table to sell for like a buck a piece when people come in and ask for something Carl Kiesel did to get signed. Well, when he hadn't brought anything, I got, I got very fortunate. Mark Spears, again, who had been at my show last year, happened to come through the Metropolis Supercon where I was selling. And I said... Mark, I hate to ask this. I, this, I was wondering, are you going to be going back to Artist Alley soon? And he said, well, we're going to walk down and then come back. I said, would you do me a favor? I have this box of Carl Kiesel books, and I'm busy right now selling. <laughs> would you be willing, Could you, when you come back, could you pick these up and take them to him so that he would have stuff he could put on his table and like give away for people? to? Or I said, he can sell them. He can give them away. I don't care what he does with them. <laughs> yeah. And he said, sure. And sure enough, a little later, he comes back, grabs that box of comics, and then goes over, and I get, uh, I had left my phone number with Carl Kiesel, and I get a text later on that says, hey, I finished your sketch, you can pick it up. I text him back, said, great, I'll be there 
you know, before Artist Alley closes on Saturday to pick it up. So um, I go back in Saturday and say, hey, I'm here to pick up my, my sketch. And, and he said, I've got you to thank for these books, don't I? I said, yeah, yeah. I said, he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you, I'm just going to give you your sketch. I said, I did not send you these comic books <laughs> to get this sketch for free. You know, I, I just wanted you to have something here, and I appreciate you coming. And he said, no. He, so he insisted. So I let him give me the sketch, which was super awesome. So I got this, I got this bouncing boy sketch, who, of course, was one of, is the Legion, you know, guy who was in that Legion of Substitute. Uh, he was like there. He was so. their mentor, their trainer. Mentor, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, so that was just that was just really really cool and I, and I was really really appreciative of that so it was an awesome weekend for me for those couple of experiences that made the whole weekend worthwhile it was great meeting both of those guys and and then catching up again with Mark Spears and he's an awesome guy um, we've talked in some of our uh, next phase episodes about some of the variant covers uh, that he has coming up there it is thank you galactic bounty hunters that is the issue that i had uh, signed so i appreciate you showing that on the screen and giving me the correct title of that yep. <laughs> um so that was that was yeah i is i was just it's had an awesome weekend just for that alone nice so. <laughs> he, he's a great guy i mean just oh, so yeah. down to earth and mm-hmm. i mean of course it helps that you don't have a you, you know it wasn't like a elbow to elbow at the time i was in there at least yes. so he he, no. he had no problem talking as long as he wanted to talk mm-hmm. yeah yeah so and that's what's kind of nice about uh, about the superman celebration is those creators there they often do have time so yeah. it was with the only time that there really was an opportunity was the year that george perez was there oh, I bet. And you you were in line for hours for him so oh, of but, course uh, and i could tell us i'll save that story for some other time about my poor wife and george perez so. <laughs> <laughs> But she's a she was a rock star on a Superman celebration for me one weekend. So <laughs> I, <laughs> okay, I, I have to give credit to the to the vendors there because I, I picked up some good stuff from you, and around the corner I got me an Adam number one. From, I think you got that from A and J Comics. Yeah, if I remember. Correctly. Yeah, A and J. From you, mm-hmm. I got the Marvels hardcover. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that's a great one to have. And I bought some stuff in the back, some uh, dollar books from uh, one of the vendors. And no, I, that, I believe that would have been Marcus Mosley, probably I believe it very, was. very back. Yep. Yeah. And the very last thing I bought was almost by happenstance. I seen that there was there were some treasury editions, and I'm always looking for those, you know, because I collect them. And I found oh. one that I already had, but it was mm-hmm. in such better condition than the copy I had. It was the. Ironically enough, the Amazing World Amazing. of Superman. Yes. Mm-hmm. And the one I had was just destroyed. Barely yep. together, and this one was in really good shape. It was well worth the what mm-hmm. twenty or twenty bucks or so I paid for it. So yeah. I was that's the one they that. reprinted, and um, they did it as a hardcover. Yeah, yeah. And they actually had a Metropolis special edition on it. And I'd picked up like for two or two couple of shows ago. I picked up like two or three of those since the town name is Metropolis, mm-hmm. which, which yep. is why it's the home of Superman, right? Right, and those did not last very long once people realized it said Metropolis. Yeah, you know, on I bet the, on the reprint car- cover. So yeah, <laughs> it was cool. So anyway, there you had it. We had an awesome time there at the Superman celebration, uh, and it's it's always good. There's so, a lot of people who I see every year there. I've been sitting up there and selling for, with the exception of the COVID year, like at least eight, nine, probably ten or eleven years now. So it's wow, been, it's been a good time. So, all right, enough about that nonsense. Why don't we talk about comic books right <laughs> let's do it so so we're going to start with the galactus trilogy and of course this takes place in fantastic four issues 48 to 50 and it's best known for having the significant first appearances of both silver surfer and galactus <laughs> this is a couple of minor characters in the in the marvel universe right <laughs> right uh, this is uh yeah this is written by stan lee drawn of course by jack kirby this was part of their extensive run and this is right there's there's this block of i don't know 10 issues or so which is probably the the peak of this duo on fantastic four because leading up to this we had a lot of inhuman stories immediately after this we get this man this monster and the introduction of the black panther Mm -hmm. so i mean it's it's a solid run um, of issues so it's written by stan lee drawn by jack kirby uh joe sinnott did the inks Stan Goldberg gets credits for coloring on issue 50. It doesn't list the colorists for issues uh, 48 and 49. 
even either in the book or online the place that i looked at as well so i don't know if he inked all three or if kirby or excuse me i don't know if he colored all three or or not and then i found a couple of names for the lettering duty of Artie simic and sam rosen so i um, i found on well i was i had it up on my computer here already but mm-hmm. on on marvel fandom stan goldberg gets the credits for colorist Stan, that's why I said okay oh, for issue fifty. Yeah, Stan Goldberg for fifty. Oh, I'm. I, it didn't. I was didn't know about forty eight and forty nine. Oh, gotcha. Okay, sorry. Yeah, forty eight. No, it's fine. Forty eight and forty nine. It doesn't list in the book. I was looking at um, comics.org for the credits yeah. there, and they didn't list the they didn't list colorist on on there. No, as well. they didn't. So I I'm assuming that Kirby didn't color himself, but uh, who knows? I mean, I, it probably was Stan Goldberg, and and he just didn't get credit for some reason on those. On those other two issues, but I did think it was odd that the the letter would get credit before the colorist. You know? Right. So, <laughs> it's true. All right. So anyway, <clears throat> uh, Fantastic Four issue number forty eight. Now the first six and a half pages um, actually wraps up the previous issue story, which felt really really odd, right? Mm-hmm. So starting on page seven. We find the Silver Surfer zooming along the starways and being observed, observed by the Skrulls, who remark that if the Surfer is here, then Galactus cannot be far behind. The Fantastic Four, returning on a chartered jet from their adventure with the Inhumans, note that the sky appears to be aflame. Johnny Storm flies ahead only to further scare the general populace as they think the flame is his responsibility. Johnny is saved by Ben Grimm, and Reed heads to the lab to investigate what is going on. Back uh, in the cosmos, the Silver Surfer notes the Earth's sun and realizes a planet capable of sustaining life must be near. Sue, furious with Reed for ignoring her and his own health, barges into the lab to discover the Watcher working with Reed. The Watcher is responsible for the fire in the skies and now the space debris in an attempt to hide the Earth from Galactus's herald. The Silver Surfer is not fooled by the Watcher's attempt to hide the planet. Once he lands, he signals his master, and after a brief skirmish with the FF, we learn that the Galactus' ship has entered the atmosphere. During the skirmish, the Thing knocks the Silver Surfer off the building, and the Surfer vanishes. The ship then lands on the roof, and the Watcher and the Fantastic Four are there as Galactus emerges. Alright, so the first thing with issue number 48, it's so weird to me... To see the previous issue go like really six pages, six and a half pages into this issue. So I'm really thinking that like 40, uh, 47, like maybe should have just been an extra size issue. <laughs> and 40, 48 should have been a filler. And then gla- the, these two, this story should have just been in 49 and 50. Because even when we get to 50, we're going to see that. That story ends about halfway through the book, <laughs> right. right? And it really moves on to something else. Yeah. So it's like they kind of got 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 out of sync with, sequence on this. For well, some I reason wondered if it was a, if that was how it was done on a regular basis back then. I, I didn't know. I haven't read many, not since that first five issues of Fantastic Four in the last year or so. But I thought, well, they really overlap overlap the storylines, and of course they do have interweaving plot mm-hmm. lines, but. This one, like you said, that that Inhumans story was... I mean, it wasn't really even close to being... It wasn't finished. It wasn't like, oh, mm-hmm. well, we we, yeah. we, uh, we had the negative zone and that's where they went. It, it was like, yeah. like you said, several pages. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, oh, we're done here. Right. I, I'm starting to think that like, whenever I read this... Like the last time that I must have read this story, I, I, I must have read it in an edition that just basically started at that page 7 oh, or something like maybe. that. I, and just kind of like, I don't know, maybe for space or to save money on like a trade or something like that. So they kind of like focused in on the, the key parts and not did the entire thing. Because I'd had no recollection of this. But it's been a long time since I, you know, read the actual issues as opposed to something that might have been in trade. Mm-hmm. So Yeah. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on issue uh, 48? I was thinking if this book came out now... This would have been this one issue would have been two or three issues at least. Like I was so <laughs> surprised at how quickly we went from introducing Silver Surfer and him, you know, figuring out what the next planet is to getting Galactus by the end of this first issue it was just like, <laughs> oh, we've already got Galactus. I I did not expect that at all whatsoever. 
Uh, that was my big <laughs> takeaway from this issue. The second one is... I, from the little bit of Watcher that I have experienced in, in Marvel books, he kind of just mm. makes up his own rules as to how he can interfere and what, right? Like, that is kind of the gimmick of, mm. of the Watcher. It's like, I don't interfere yeah. unless I really want to, is what it kind of... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Unless I think I need to. Unless it's really, really important. Yeah. So. <laughs> He's worse than, than even the Phantom Stranger. The Phantom Stranger did try to stay a bit, uh, you know, above the fray. Gotcha. But... Everything I've read with the Watcher, it's like that is the shtick. He's meddling. Like, no oh, I can't yeah. get involved, but oh, I better get involved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, I won't get involved unless it's really necessary, and it appears to be really necessary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and apparently, it's always really necessary. Right, yeah. exactly. Every little thing. So, <laughs> but he's a great character too. I, I oh yeah. Then this is the first time that I was looking on the history part of this, and this is the first time that the Watcher openly violates that oath of yeah. non-interference. Oh, okay. For those that yeah. like to track the firsts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that constantly keeps up. I don't normally interfere. Yes. But it's so important this time. So that beca- yeah, that becomes a regular gimmick. All right, what do you think about what do you think about the Gal- Galactus' costume here in this, this last page? The red and green yes. with the big, G the big G on the chest. Yeah, big G in the middle yeah. of the chest. And I He's think that pants, G stands yeah. for gangsta. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's probably, you know, the, the circle around the G is not a circle. It's an O. So he's the OG. OG. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's the OG. That's he's the, the original Galactus. The cosmic gangster. Yeah. That's right. So speaks Galactus. <laughs> he looks like a cosmic Santa Claus, though. He just needs a white beard to go with the red and green. So. And, you know, the, one of the that page, uh, I believe that's uh, 19. I made a note of it here. I was just blown away by that art. What that is, I wish I was an art critic. I wish... That is a different okay. kind of art where they show okay, those yeah, spaceships. I have, I have another. So I, I, I think, is this not decoupage where you take, where basically Kirby did this thing for a while. With photo. He would occasionally cut out pictures and put yeah. them on the page. So does that sound right to you Maybe. guys, decoupage? Okay, because it's also like, I think he does something like this. Uh, with the introduction of the negative zone, where he instead of uh, drawing it, he literally like cuts out things out of magazines and stuff, and yeah. and pastes them on the page, you know, to kind of create this. And it's it's out. it's it's not black and white, but it's very mono, monochrome. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's interesting, and I just, I mean, it brought some it it brought some shock value for what was happening there right before Galactus does his introduction on the next page. Decoupage. Well, I guess the goal there was is okay. is the art of decorating an object by gluing colored paper cutouts onto in combination with special paint effects, gold leaf, and other decorative elements. So yeah, I think decoupage is okay. Is appropriate. Okay. Thank you for that uh, that official. <laughs> yeah. I guess it also gives it that like alien feel because it's so much different than the other pages, you know. So I think that maybe helps a little bit as well, but. It, I don't know. I think I would have rather seen Kirby draw this yeah. than decoupage. It threw me myself, off. I thought but... that somebody loaded the wrong page into the comic. I was like, because <laughs> it was so just, it was just one, and there was no, there's no word bubbles or anything on on that. There's nothing nope. to it, is no. there? Mm-hmm. And uh, well, yeah. there is one word. There is one word dialogue bubble, but about he just saying, yeah. see the the great oh. spheres. Is, this great sphere is opening, and but the the person speaking is on the previous page. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's right. It's off page. It's, yeah. That's so weird. Yeah, so this is not the only time Kirby uses this technique, and and I I had this recollection from that Mark Evanier Kirby book where he talks about you know this is one of those Kirby experimental things mm. that he was just he tried out a few different times. So now I sort of collect. In fact, this past weekend I bought a an issue of I want to say it was uh, is it Marvel Triple Action? Is that a that's a reprint title from reprint Marvel? Title. Yeah. One of the, I got I got a, I know it was a Marvel comic, but it was it was a photo background with mm-hmm. art on top of it. So okay. I kind of I pick them up when I see stuff like that if I don't have it already, and I like that. I, I like anything like that's kind of unique yeah. like that. I mean, it's not overdone, you know. So mm-hmm. it was fun. This was also the first time Black Bolt apparently uh, his inability to speak was revealed. Right. Oh, okay. Because he, I mean, he shows up in a previous issue, right? You know, this is not Black Bolt's first appearance, but I don't think they t- explain why he never says anything. Yeah. 
Gotcha. Um, of course, that's not really part of the Galactus trilogy part of the story. No, it's so. not. No. But it, it's the, that other six pages, you know. I might yeah. be wrong about that anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Go forty nine. I don't. Yeah, I don't have anything else for uh, for forty eight. Unless you guys have any other comments for forty eight. That's all I got. Not really. No, I don't think so. All right. All right. Shad, you want to handle? Oh, I got one question. 40... Oh, sorry. Yes. Let's go. Before we get into forty nine, mm-hmm. what is more valuable? Forty eight with the cameo, the last panel cameo of Galactus, mm-hmm. or forty nine with the full? Appearance? Well, forty eight because it's the first Silver Surfer. Oh, of course. okay that's that's an easy one (laughs) yeah that that, that changes everything okay got it (laughs) there was there was a brief period of time where there was this spike in 49 i think it was right around the time they first announced that galactus may make an appearance Mm. for some reason there were some i think there was just a few crazy sales of 49 that pushed it past 48 but i think that leveled off and while shad's going over uh 49 i'll look up some some pricing information on those too how about that all right okay all right issue 49 the watcher informs galactus that this planet contains intelligent life and should not be destroyed galactus is not swayed and the thing and johnny storm attack but their attacks are easily dismissed by galactus despite the end of the world being nigh the watcher dismisses the fantastic four who are sent home and decide to shave and bathe the Silver Surfer. I was like, is that right? I forgot about that. Uh, <laughs> the Silver Surfer has managed to land in the apartment of Alicia Masters. Alicia begins to teach the Silver Surfer about how humans are different from others and he has encountered others than he has encountered before. Galactus has begun construction of his world devouring device, and the Watcher sends the human torch on a mission to obtain a m- machine to save the human race. Back at her apartment, Alicia Masters continues to teach the Silver Surfer about humanity. Mr. Fantastic, Invisible Woman, and The Thing again attempt to battle Galactus to at least give the Human Torch some additional time to complete his mission. Galactus summons the Punisher, no, not that Punisher, to defend him as he (laughs) continues working on his device. Back at the apartment, Alicia Masters has managed to move the Silver Surfer to act to save humanity. The surfer flies off to face Galactus, but the watcher ret- warns the reader that the surfer's inherent in- interference. Sorry, that warns the reader that the surfer's interference may result in the Earth's total destruction. I'm glad that you put that in the note, Scott, about the Punisher, because I wanted to know. <laughs> obviously, that's not the Punisher, but is this does this predate the Punisher? I guess. The... Oh, definitely. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, the Punisher doesn't show up until Amazing Spider-Man 129. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Probably so, yeah. Six, so seven this years is, later, maybe? Yeah, several several years. Gotcha. I, I'd, I'd have to look up the dates. So, you know, I don't I don't. I don't right. know right off the top Well, this of was 66, head. so whatever. I, I want to say that Spider-Man issue was 73. You need me to go pull out my slab. I can go pull <laughs> oh, out my no, Amazing 129 no. slab. Show, and we can do a comparison uh... if you want. <laughs> humble brags, humble brags. <laughs> Sorry. I had the All same right. note though, she had about huh, Punisher. I wonder if at least the name maybe inspired the uh, I am sure it is just they had that name and they yeah. wanted to use they liked the name, they wanted to use it again, or you know, they were worried about it falling out of trademark sure. or copyright or whatever. He's um, a goofy looking dude though. Uh, he is. He actually he reminds me of the oh gosh. The Cree centuries is that right? There were they centuries. I can't remember, but it it has a very similar look to Cree. I, again, I I can't. I may be getting this name wrong, but there are these robots that were that were part of the Captain Mar Marvel story where you had the Cree. They were kind of left on as I don't know to watch the Earth or whatever, and they would pop up periodically in some Captain Marvel stories. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um, but. Uh, I thought it kind okay, of vaguely like, reminded me of Kang, but like in a fro- like Kang suit, but if a frog wore it, or a lizard. Yeah. Or some sort. <laughs> well, that. Well, it's it's like it's a lot of it has to do with just the green and purple, you know, because those yeah. those Cree sentries were also like green and purple, That's right. and Kang, yeah. of course, is green and purple. So classic villain colors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> and they're described as half robot, half alive. 
Okay. Okay. All right. I want to go back to that your comment about uh, FF forty eight and forty nine. Which one is worth more mm. money? Because I I just got a little bit of a shock here. Now this there's a website called Go Collect which I use to to do some pricing on, and they do this fair market value analysis. So a nine point eight of FF forty eight has according to them a fair market value of sixty six thousand dollars. FF forty nine at nine point eight has a fair market value of a hundred and ten thousand dollars, which is not quite double. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. Now that being said, there have been zero nine point eight sales of FF forty nine in the last year. Okay, mm-hmm. so that is is uh you know makes you kind of question. Whereas there have been um. Let's see, two sales at least of FF48 um, and one actual sale of $79,000. Okay. Um, so I just jumped on eBay and put in FF48 CGC 5.0. And like the you could the looks like the least expensive buy it now for a 48 at 5.0 is $1,400. For 49, the least expensive 5.0 is $3,300. So I don't know. Maybe 49 is worth more than 48. Um, but uh, I personally value the 48 over the 49. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that does make sense. I. Yeah. But you know. So. That's, but that right seems... now the market's saying something different than what I thought. So. And maybe that has something to do with. You know the next big villain mm-hmm. um, in the market. Well, now that we have Cinematic, the maybe, yeah. FF cast, you know, mm-hmm. maybe that's what's kind of driving that. So, um, so anyway, it'll be interesting to see how that actually, how that actually. Oh, hold on a second. I didn't have my FF forty nine sorted by best or by lowest to highest. So let me let me fix that here real quick and go change that to buy it now. Let's see if that still actually holds true. Okay, no. You can actually buy it now for seven hundred and fifty dollars. Fantastic for forty nine. So forty eight is definitely more valuable than okay. forty nine. Well it would make more sense, I mean, yes. with Silver Sur- Silver Sur- yeah. Surfer and the cameo. Cameo Galactus. Which isn't like just... a it's not a a cheap cameo either. It's no, a full body no. shot, you know. It's full, yeah. It's it's a sa- it's almost identical to the Wolverine cameo at the end of one eighty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's really that last oversized panel, you know. It's kind right. of what it boils down to. Of course, I think the Wolverine cameos maybe full page. I can't remember. now that I talk about it. I can't remember if it's full page or or like two thirds page, and then the Galactus is you know two thirds or oh, at least half the page, if not if not more than half the page. I guess I should just flip to it and look at it. Yeah, it's two thirds of the page there. So yeah. But I was really surprised when I saw that go collect value, which is why I had to get on eBay and see what I could actually, what they were actually selling for. So. Yeah, right. Which also tells you you can't always trust the fair market value on these websites. Mm-hmm. So. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, f- let's see. I had a couple comments on forty nine. Uh, you know, the amazing coincidence that the Silver Surfer lands in the thing's uh, girlfriend's apartment. You know, right. that's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and he woos her. Yeah, he doesn't mean to, but we'll get into that part. Uh, yeah, next we'll issue. get that yeah. a little later on there. Yeah, but you'll also notice the Galactus had a uh, sudden realization that his green uh, on mm-hmm. purple wasn't working, so yep. he switched tunics to sort of a maroon color under his purple, mm-hmm. <laughs> and he switched from shorts to pants. <laughs> He did? <laughs> yeah. All right, so, excuse me. He switched from pants to shorts. Pants to shorts. Yeah, yeah right. Because right. in, in 48, he was wearing shorts. Or he's wearing <laughs> pants. Now in 49, he's wearing that. shorts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is that's probably the colorist's fault. But, <laughs> and maybe that's why they didn't give the colorist credit. Because it's right. Sure <laughs> no. But, <laughs> I'm sure they weren't really, you know, worried about continuity yeah. and, and stuff yeah. like that. Just going from one to the other, you know. Um, and you would think an editor or something would pick up on that, but yeah, probably not. <laughs> probably my favorite scene, which was actually it wasn't even a mistake. It was just I mean because they they talk about it is when Ben and Reed are shaving and taking a bath. 
when all hell's breaking loose and yeah. and you got Johnny who's like what is wrong with you guys you <laughs> <laughs> it was just a great it was a great scene Johnny's all dirty from his battle and mm-hmm. these guys are in there getting spruced up for the next spruced up yeah <laughs> things like washing between his toes you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like what what uh Obviously, a different time for story, a different method of storytelling. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> All right, you guys got any other comments for forty nine? Nope, I don't. All right, Mike, you want to send us on to issue fifty? All right. Well, now that the Silver Surfer has turned against Galactus, the two battle as the Silver Surfer fights to save the planet. For the most part, the Fantastic Four are only able to watch and wait as the, the two powers greater than theirs battle. However, the Human Torch returns from his mission with a device that at full power could erase the entire sol- solar system in one microsecond. Reed Richards then stretches the device in front of Galactus, the device known to Galactus as the ultimate nullifier. Galactus realizes that the Watcher has interfered and thus promises to never destroy the Earth in exchange for the device. Galactus, despite being above the petty emotion of malice, removes the Silver Surfer's ability to leave the planet. Galactus then leaves as Alicia Masters rushes to talk to the Silver Surfer, completely ignoring Ben Grimm, who leaves himself more than a bit jealous. Alicia wishes to introduce the Surfer to the Fantastic Four, but she soon finds herself alone on the roof as the Surfer also leaves to explore the planet Earth. Thus ends the Galactus Trilogy. But not this issue. (laughs) (laughs) The issue concludes with newspapers declaring Galactus a hoax. Of course, J. Jonah Jameson behind that. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. Uh, An unnamed villain plotting against the Fantastic Four. A college football team needing a new player to help an aging coach. Sue and Reed still fighting, Ben questioning his relationship with Alicia, Johnny Storm meeting Wyatt Wingfoot and heading off to college, and the Inhumans trying to break free of their imprisonment. So, for the record, the bald man, the unnamed villain, is a guy named Ricardo Jones, who will become important in the next issue, issue 51. I was going to ask, that was my first question for you, was... Who was that guy? And... <laughs> and to be clear, I did not know. I had to look it up. Ah. So just just for the record, that's not something I had uh, I had memorized. <laughs> Isn't that unusual that it's? I mean, it's the short version of Ricardo would be Rick. Mm-hmm. So not to be Rick, confused not with confused Rick, Jones. Rick Jones. Not, yeah. not Rick Jones. So, um, and Galactus does still have pants in this issue. So <laughs> I just want to point that oh, out. Okay. As well. Wardrobe change again. Mm-hmm. Does uh yeah. does Johnny? I know it has nothing to do with the Galactus trilogy, but does Johnny leave the Fantastic Four after this issue for a while and go to college, or does he remain on the team? Yeah, I think he remains on the team. Really, okay. t- as far as I know, off the top of my head, the team stays intact until the like issue two. S- 70 oh, okay. oh gosh i want to say two in the 270s um after secret wars the okay. thing leaves and she hulk joins mm-hmm. the team i remember that oh okay. you know what i i gotta i gotta correct that because i think there may have been an issue or two where ben loses his power and they might have actually brought power man in to replace oh really yeah um hmm. I can't remember though where that falls in the, you know, like in the timeline. So, but I, she, ulti- okay. yeah, ultimately, She Hulk replaces the thing for yeah. an extended period of time. And I remember that real time when that happened. I remember. Mm-hmm. I mean, I wasn't buying them much, but I remember seeing them on the stands. And I always found that to be inter- interesting about teams that have a number in the name. So they're kind right. of hamstrung, and they're like, you know, you can't be the Fatal Five with six people you can't that's be right. yeah the fantastic four with three people so yeah somebody's <laughs> gotta come back on yeah that's why i, I asked because i didn't know if they were setting up for johnny to leave to go to college and for the silver surfer to take his place on the fantastic four 
at that point. Uh, n- definitely not. I can not I can say that that does not happen. Gotcha. Yeah. What ultimately happens is um, apparently the Silver Surfer is one hundred percent a Jack Kirby creation. Okay. But Stanley apparently loved the character so much that we end up getting a Silver Surfer solo series. Right. Mm. That nineteen sixty eight Eight. series, I think. Um, that's and that comes out of this out of this character. Oh, okay. And but even though Kirby created the surfer, Kirby doesn't get to draw the surfer on that series until the very last issue. So yeah, so Who did draw him? Uh, I think it was uh, John Buscema, if I remember yeah. correctly, um, was the artist on that particular book. So, I mean, you you mentioned this earlier when we, before we even started doing the synopsis, was that this seems to be sort of, if not the peak, at least a peak in the creativeness mm-hmm. of Kirby and Lee. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just chock full of characters and ideas and devices. I mean, I don't even know a whole lot about Marvel comics, but the Ultimate Nullifier, I mean, that is that is like everybody knows how big a deal that is. Well, it's the Ultimate MacGuffin is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> we need something to be able to stop them, yeah. yeah. But at least they made it, they complicated the plot a little bit by sending, the Watcher sending Johnny Storm yeah. all the way across the universe to get it. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I was a little confused because I thought uh, I, I might be confusing the negative zone with this. I thought that Johnny maybe went to the negative zone, but I think he actually went to Galactus's uh, previous universe somehow to get it. Because I might be wrong. Because the negative uh, zone is more it's more in that ultimate or inhuman story. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean it's it's. The negatives, a lot of these, of course, you know, a lot of these ideas aren't completely fleshed out at this point. You mm-hmm. know, it's just like they're, they're, they're probably Lee and Kirby think they're, you know, obviously they're, they think they're doing throwaway stories or at least a good portion of this. Yeah. How long, how long is this going to actually go right. on? You yeah. Know? And uh, so, but you can definitely see, I mean, like if we were talking about this being a first five for Galactus and Silver Surfer, it's like, well, these two Galactus and Silver Surfer have changed quite a bit, but the essence of those characters is still basically mm-hmm. the same. You know, moving on, and they're, they've been used uh, dramatically different. And the same can be said about the Negative Zone. The same can be said about Galactus. Uh, all, all of that that the uh, Kirby and Lee kind of established. You know, yeah, for the for the Marvel Universe. Yeah, was this uh, again, fight I- too big? Oh, sorry, Mike. No, no, go ahead. Uh, was th- this fight seemed too big for just the Fantastic Four to handle? Were there other heroes at this point? Did the Avengers exist? Oh, like, mm-hmm. this seems a little big for uh, for four <laughs> heroes. When I'm sure there's other people just down the street. They're in New York City, and everybody's in New York City in the Marvel Universe. So, yeah, yeah, I'm you. This at this point, I'm kind of surprised that we didn't at least see them mention the Avengers or mention mm-hmm. Spider Man or, or you know, even yeah. Daredevil or something. I mean, because those characters were all around and and they were trying to build that. You know, they had crossovers at this point, um, so it is kind of surprising that they wouldn't just you know, if the world is about ready to end, yeah, right. they, you know. <laughs> But th- but I guess on the flip side of that, I mean, it all takes place in a... Well, I mean, I guess they all should have noticed the sky turning to flame <laughs> and the, the, the space degree and should have, you know... But maybe they were just investigating it right, their own yeah. way. Who knows? You I know, mean, it was one just... Of those it was no prize things. <laughs> it was just before the companies really capitalized on, you know, these big events. This could have been, this should have been oh, yeah. a big event. I mean, with a, with a powerhouse like Galactus. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, if it wasn't for the uh, aforementioned MacGuffin, I mean, there's yeah. no way they could have beat him. Beat right. him you know, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, you could totally see this being like a crossover for like whatever. It's like, OK, so it starts in the FF and then the Avengers go battle and are defeated. And then Spidey swings in with Daredevil and they try to do some trick and it doesn't fail. And then finally the Watcher <laughs> sends Johnny to wherever and mm-hmm. brings back the ultimate nullifier. And now everybody's been involved and. And, uh, you know, we've had multiple crossovers. Right. But uh, I guess, you know, this really this kind of shows the Marvel method. This is like, you know, one of the ultimate, I think, representations of the Marvel method yeah. where you have the we have the 
the Lee says, all right, let's do some <laughs> alien comes and is going to destroy the planet and the FF have to, you know, destroy it. Go. And then mm-hmm. he's jumping Kirby on the couch starts, when he does that. <laughs> yeah. And Kirby starts drawing. And like, I, I mean, I've heard like a story where it's like, Lee looks at the pages. He's like, who's this guy on a surfboard? Because <laughs> it, it wasn't even in, you know, what he had given. So that's funny. Uh, it's just, yeah. So then he has to put in dialogue for all of mm-hmm. that. The dialogue comes, you know, later on. So, <laughs> but they, you're right. They are on well, we fire. Gotta, this is, this is, it has to be. I, I wrote the same thing down in my notes. It's like, I don't know a lot of Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, like stuff, not reading it, but like, Reading these three issues is like these guys are on fire. They know what they're doing. Yeah. They've got it locked <laughs> in and they've got it down to a science and it feels good. Uh, which is uh, for me to say that about a, an older comic like this is not, uh, that's a high praise. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, I would agree. Hearing you say that, Shad, is makes it, 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 it validates my own thoughts in that, you know, I, it's not that I didn't read Silver Age, Bronze Age comics, but I read a lot of DC which mm-hmm. a lot of those were pretty bland, especially mm-hmm. like the dialogue. And they, you know, they were kind of notorious for having, you could interchange the words with characters <laughs> and you wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> no but with this, you, you have no doubt when when Reed's talking and he's got that high and mighty mm-hmm. sanctimonious speech mm-hmm. giving, or you've got Johnny going off and, and, and Sue complaining about Reed ignoring her. And then, of course, Ben Grimm, the most... Mm-hmm. recognizable dialogue is his when it, I mean even like on page 10 when Reed's kind of like saying you know he's just talking about how it's the end of the world and just stating the obvious and then Ben says can't you ever get struck speechless like the rest of us <laughs> <laughs> I just I mean you stop in your tracks when you read that because it's so good so it's it's yeah. impressive I have to read, I have to quote this. So this is like towards the, this is after the trilogy, the, the Galactus story ends here at the end. And it's the, the fight between Sue and Reed. She sneaks into his lab and it's like, Sue, what are you doing here? How many times have I told you not to pussyfoot in on me while I'm working? Yeah. You might have been hurt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was straight like Leave it to Beaver or, you know, Bewitched yes. or one of those old TV shows yeah. dialogues, you know. Oh, it's just like they got a little bit of everything. They got a little bit of a little tiny bit of romance and mm-hmm. a little tiny bit of superhero and a little tiny bit of the sci-fi monster and the little yeah. you know it's just yeah. all all over the place. But yeah, and I mean, but. I I don't know if you're going to get to that, but that uh, the the eight or nine pages of epilogue. Mm-hmm. Well, that was that list I yeah you know, there at the yeah. end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. Um, but I mean, I liked it because I've heard about. I've heard people talk about this before on one podcast or another when they're talking about a plot or mm-hmm. they're talking about the climax being like at the very end and you don't mm-hmm. really get that cool off period. This does mm-hmm. give you that chance to catch your breath as a reader because mm-hmm. you had the climax and then you mm-hmm. have whether it be just, you know, day in the life. OK, this is I remember even Crisis on Infinite Earths did a good job of this on, you know, like a whole half an issue or an issue there at the end about you know it wasn't it wasn't about you know didn't bring the climax right to the end and that's what this did you had everything the subplots of you know ben being kind of butthurt about uh alicia alicia and the being, surfer yeah, yeah alicia and the surfer and then you had the appearance of the bald-headed guy who i mm-hmm. i thought was a cross between lex luther and uh uh <sighs> creel the the, oh, the uh, oh. guy with the Absorbing yeah. man, yeah. Absorbing man, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, Creel, and then yet yeah. the football okay. player. I like. I have no idea yeah. about the football player and the coach. And that, it, I think that's a Johnny Storm storyline. Yeah. Okay, moving forward, he become. I think he becomes the star player maybe later on. Okay, uh, to help the coach. Yeah. You know, the then, the significant character there yeah. at the end is was Wyatt Wingfoot. Yeah. Now, what did he did he develop into a a, a superhero or just a, a uh, okay. not that I know of. Okay, but some interesting things about him. Is, okay, he's Indigenous American, mm-hmm. yeah. right? So he's an Indigenous American character introduced here uh, in this story. Um, he is actually, when you read the Black Panther story in 52, 53, he's actually the one that saves the day. 
He's the one that sets the Fantastic Four free oh. from the traps the Black Panther puts them in. Spoilers. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoiler alert, right? Um, to uh, <laughs> to set them free. And then also in that whenever Byrne takes over and She-Hulk joins the team, Wingfoot and She-Hulk have a relationship oh. So at that point. So he's he's around uh, for a while. And I, I don't remember the last time I personally read a story that he was in. But I mean... He's he's in the book. He's in the Fantastic Four. What is that? Two hundred and thirty issues later. Wow. You wow. know, so he's around for a long time. You know, when you talk about that two seventy two seventy run, mm-hmm. where towards I I want to say the, towards the end of Burns Run, but I know he was on two fifty. I don't think he was on at three hundred, but maybe he was even still on. I don't I don't know how close to the end of Burns mm-hmm. Run on FF that was. So. Well, I like so they he, I mean, they portrayed him. I mean, he was drawn at least like a a foot and a half taller than Johnny. Mm-hmm. So he's a big guy. And he, I mean, what do you think? He, he might be the, it might be the first time an indigenous American was portrayed in a, uh, not a stereotypical way. It was in a good way or uh, that, um, that I don't, I have no idea there. Cause I'm sure they, I mean, you think about, I think about, um, Tom Kamalku, the, uh, kind of like the sidekick for green lantern for Hal Jordan. Mm-hmm. But he had a, I mean, even his nickname was, uh, was uh, uh, was derogative, you know. So, <laughs> uh, so you know, and I don't know. It's just interesting that um, this is pretty early, 1966. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I also, especially when we're talking about books that are this old, I try not to get hung. And I learned this from Dan Brown. I try not to get too hung up. Obviously. If Wyatt Wingfoot is Indigenous American, his skin should probably be a little bit darker, right? Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, sure. when you look at his representation in this, but you know, when we, actually it was from when we were talking about the vigilante, right? Y'all know if you remember this in vigilante, oh yeah, yeah. But they had an Arab woman drawn it. They drew her. She was colored purple. Purple. Yes. You know, and it's just like what? That's, That's yeah. so. But it what it was. It was just a limited color palette. It's out. You know, and again, I'm taking what Dan had taught, told yeah. us whenever we were recording that episode. It's like. Yeah. So they had to make a color palette choice here, you know. So yeah, but at least um, he had the he had sort of the some of the features, the wide cheekbones the, and the, br- the, the sort of hair. the nose, mm-hmm. and yeah, it was. So yeah, it was good. So I, I think it was at least for the time at a, a reasonable attempt, you know, to <laughs> right to you know try reasonable to enough, him. I think to make make note of it. I that's I was yeah. happy mm-hmm. to see what I seen. Yeah. yeah. You guys got any last comments on the Galactus trilogy? Yeah, it covers all my only notes. one is it's just maybe just re saying what I said earlier about Lee and Kirby were masters of weaving these plot lines in mm-hmm. a natural way. It didn't feel jarring or anything. I mean, you you can count you know, six or eight different plot lines in these mm-hmm. three books. And it was it was nice. It was very good. Do we want to grade this? Sure. Oh, sure. Okay, I'll go first, and I this to be. I'm going to this is this has a little nostalgia grade into it. Plus, Silver Surfer probably being my second favorite character out of all characters. <laughs> I, I'm an, I'm going to give this story. I'm going to give this a very fine 8.0. I mean, it's there's so much that comes out of this story. You know, obviously we're talking about the 60s. It's a little. It's I think it's complex storytelling for the 60s but very simplistic storytelling for the modern era it it, it holds up reasonably well mm-hmm. so and again i'm probably overgrading this but it, it's just I, I i got a little nostalgia bump there so i got to keep it at least an 8.0 i want to say like 9.6 but i'm gonna go eight. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i agree i agree with you though scott i mean i've i i put it on 8.5 a very fine plus i i feel like i was grading on a curve like it was very much uh for what the era is yeah. and, and and i mean it's probably one of the best stories i've read of that era uh so yeah i really dug it And you forgot to unmute yourself, Mike. Maybe maybe he's having some technical issues. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm still on mute. Yep. <laughs> there we go. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I'm with you, Shad, eight point five. And it is <laughs> it's I to me I think it's it, it would be a 
you, it would be an injustice to go much lower than that. I, I, I know that everything's relative, but mm. and you also are looking at this through the lens of decades and it, whether it's nostalgia mm. as a pot of it, positive influence, or you just know this is a classic as a positive influence, or you mm. know that okay, so it's uh, some of the s- story features are dated. That may be a mm. negative influence, but still despite any of the negatives it told a great story and when you look at i remember as a kid the first time i seen jack kirby's art i was like not impressed i was like no it was all fourth world stuff and i was Mm -hmm. like what the heck all these giant fists and square knuckles and Mm -hmm. but seeing him here and maybe it has a little bit to do with the inking i i just loved it i think it was Mm -hmm. fantastic so i it's an easy 8.5 for me Okay, well, I'm going to change my grade to a nine. You deserve because... to. You deserve... <laughs> <laughs> I was trying, you know, I, I was, I was, you know, I didn't want to. You want to blow it too much out of the be water. Too high, yeah, but no, no, I, I'm, I'll stick with my. I have given in my, inferior in stories rate. an 8.0 before stories that were not as good as this, so that's yeah. the way I was looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm glad then that you enjoyed this story. So, <laughs> uh, Mike, you want to introduce our next topic? Well, I sure will. Let me pull up my notes again because I have a bajillion different windows open. Okay, so our first first five uh, segment this time around are the first five appearances of Deathstroke the Terminator. That's Slade Wilson, and the first five appearances by him were in New Teen Titans. That's the 1980s, uh, 1980 version uh, with uh, the Titans created by Marv Wolfman and George Perez. So the first appearance of Deathstroke was in New Teen Titans 2, and then you go on to New, New, Teen, New Teen Titans 9, 10, 34, and 39. And I know that we talked about when we first were discussing this that somewhere in between there was the I think it was between issues nine and or ten and thirty four mm-hmm. that there was an a, technically an appearance by Deathstroke in the New Teen Titans and X Men crossover, the Marvel DC crossover. But we agreed that that was not continuity and shouldn't count uh, in our little segment here. So did anybody get their hands on that by the chance? I have a. I have you have original, a copy. Okay. Yeah. All right. I read it just for just for fun because uh, I I was able to get a hold of it, and uh, it was okay. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 not. I, I enjoyed it. I, I I remember enjoying it probably more whenever I was what sixteen in nineteen eighty two right. when it came out. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there. I like well, the that way. was so unique to get those crossovers. They, they bet, didn't happen yeah. very often, you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And I, I mean, I like the way that they did that. Just as a little aside from this, is like the the fact that they were they were just established. They were already known. That wasn't like this. You know, now you get the the teenage mutant ninja turtles are crossing over with Stranger Things, and it's because the worlds collided and everything. But like, it was oh, yeah. just the the X Men and Teen Titans just existed. One was in New York City, and one was in Pennsylvania. Like that was that was it, or whatever right. wherever the X Men are in. Um, and, uh, but yeah, that was, I thought that was kind of cool. I don't know if I'd seen a crossover like that where they just, there wasn't this, oh my gosh, this is happening. It's like, oh, I've heard of you before. Uh, and I thought that was a a neat way that they handled that crossover. Yeah, that, that, that's been talked about before about how it's different than, you know, some of the other publisher crossovers, that they had to come up with some sort of story or reason for them, you know, they cross over the dimensional divide and ran into yeah. each other. But this, it was just more natural here and like, hey, it's nice to meet you. Uh, mm-hmm. Cyclops, huh? Well, I'm Cyborg. Nice to meet you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, but uh, now that you, we start talking about it, I wish I would have read it too. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, I could have. I read it about a year ago, reread it for the second or third time. But Oh, I got you. Yeah. I've owned it a couple of times. I don't know if I've ever read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Simonson uh, has great. I, I don't even know who the uh, writer was off the top of my head. Yeah, was it either. Wolfman or a joint effort between Wolfman and Claremont? 
I bet I would put money that it's a joint because it was they fought Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I, it it had or not been Apocalypse, a joint but Dark Side and yeah, Dark, Dark Phoenix. Side. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. God. Hey, but you got the Apocalypses where he's from, so where he's from. Yes, he's, <laughs> but uh, yeah, oh, Claire, I'm Claremont, Riding, Walter Simonson, Penciler. Oh, the, so Wolfman, so Wolfman didn't, didn't get, get credit? No, uh, nope, no okay. Wolfman on there. Okay. I mean, he got a creator mm. credit, but he didn't get a script credit. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Well. Okay. All right. So, uh, Mike, what was your first introduction to the character Deathstroke the Terminator? The first appearance in New Teen Titans number two, because I was buying these off the shelf uh, when I was a wee lad. And I would go and, you know, I was I would stake out the drugstore or the grocery store to make sure I got every copy. As before I was really doing any back issue hunting, you know, online. Or not even online, I shouldn't say that. I mean, mail order like Mile High Comics or something. But, yeah, I was buying these. And I bought this. this the copy I have now is the original one that I have. Oh, wow. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Shad, do you remember your first introduction to the character of Deathstroke? I... I think it was the Arrow TV show. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I was like, I was trying to think back. I was like, I don't. I mean, was he? Would he have been in any of like the Batman animated series or, uh, hmm. or the Justice League cartoon? Like that would have been. If not those, then it would have to be the Arrow TV show. I think. Okay. Yeah, he might have been in Justice League Unlimited or something, but. It's it's hard to say. They had they threw in everybody in those right, episodes. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I get to at least split the difference between you two. <laughs> so I am pretty confident that my first introduction to this character, along with the Teen Titans, was the Judas Contract story. Okay. Which actually comes a little bit after the first five appearances. So. Um, I think, and a lot of it stems from that Teen Titans poster that, Mike, that you and I have talked about before, yes. that Perez drawn one, where you got the tower, and you got the, you got the Titans, and it's like, you know, I need to find a story, and then that somehow, either from going to Campus Comics, or I can't remember if I picked up a trade, I don't even remember how I read this story, but I picked this up and was introduced to the character of Deathstroke, thought he was pretty cool, you know, uh... So at least a pretty cool bad guy. I thought it was a great story. You know, we end up getting Nightwing. Uh, so, yeah. So I, I actually was very fortunate to get a pretty high quality story as my introduction to Deathstroke the Terminator. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to say that my for my introduction to story number two, it's it was not, mm-hmm. it wasn't the story that would capture you. It was, there was a lot of other stuff going on that was like interesting mm-hmm. but it was you know you know you had Deathstroke was a, a mercenary mm-hmm. and he was basically uh, the hive which was one of those multi um those acronym organizations bad mm-hmm. guys and they were hiring him to kill the titans so it wasn't mm-hmm. it wasn't exactly it wasn't something that would blow you away but it was still early on in the character development in the titans was probably what captured me more than, you know, than than, than Terminator or Deathstroke himself. Yeah. yeah. So let's okay. So like, Mike, you've kind of already hit it on this, but why don't you just continue your thoughts? Like your your thoughts on how this character character originally appears. So what are your what are your initial thoughts on this original character at through these five appearances? Well, kind of like what we talked about earlier about. Uh, you know Kirby and Lee not knowing where a character would go and they didn't know if they'd last or not but I don't know that this guy had any more in their minds any more lasting power than the fearsome five or you know uh, he he was a he was he had I remember thinking even back then that okay he's got these powers that sort of are like although they the origin of the powers are a little bit different from Captain America they're similar in that he's got the strength of ten men he the idea behind him having the strength of ten men and he's and his speed and agility is behind the fact that he uh, had a uh, it 
actually, I can't even remember. How did he get it? Did he, was it a serum or was it like uh, uh, somehow? I don't. I Did they cover that? You in know, now it's, oh my gosh, I'm These issues? I, it seems like there was mention of it, but what I'm getting there at is There was something that he, about he it, use, but I don't remember what it was. Well, all I know is that it's most, according to comic book science, normal people <laughs> use 10% of their brain capacity, whereas right. Terminator, or Deathstroke uses 90%. So he can do all these things and increases everything. And I, honest to goodness, now I'm going to have to look that up and see what the origin of his powers were, whether it was... I know it had to have been some sort of artificially induced, but it, right. it, it's, you know... So, yeah, that was my first. My first wasn't exactly... I, I had more comments. My thoughts on the book itself was just seeing the development of the characters of you know characters like Starfire who couldn't speak English at the time mm-hmm. the only way she could actually learn English was physical contact and her way of getting the physical contact was making out with Dick Grayson <laughs> so <laughs> uh and Cyborg had all those cool attachments he even I mean when they had those bad guys at the dock he's fishing one of them out of the water with no less than a winch and steel cable I mean <laughs> How does that fold right. into his arm? I don't know, but it's... I, I just love that stuff. And then, of course, he had... I wonder if they didn't think maybe Slade's son, Grant, mm-hmm. who became Ravager, who mm-hmm. had this really... He had these hard feelings against the Titans. If they didn't think maybe... No, they couldn't have thought he would have been more because, you know, spoilers, they, he died. Spoilers. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. he dies. So, yeah. all right, see if this sounds correct or if this is a retcon. So, this is from DC Fandom. Uh, later, Slade volunteered for an experimental procedure, one that the government hoped would turn him into the perfect soldier. The project, based on a derivative of ACTH, had unexpected results. Upon first waking Slade... Uh, flew into a rage, attacking the soldiers and scientists around him before being subdued. The treatment was unstable, and his body reacted with a fit of hyperadrenalism, resulting in him spending weeks passing in and out of consciousness. So basically, mm-hmm. like you were saying, it was just basically a serum mm-hmm. uh, um, that gave him his power. So Which really, is a just kind complete of complete knockoff of, of Captain, America, Captain America. Yeah, yeah. yeah. except a bad guy. <laughs> and I, although I will venture to say he's not. This is blasphemy to Scott, but. Deathstroke's probably a little bit has a little bit more of the cool factor going on than Cap, but it's because he's not really depends a, on your definition. of cool. <laughs> I know I, you don't like those guys that are walk straddling the line of good and bad, um, <laughs> but he's he's got uh, he has some interesting and and later on, I mean, it gets expanded on him much more. So uh, I'm sure, mm-hmm. like in this first five, I wouldn't say he's cool. I, I feel like he's very pathetic. Like he's. He's this old man who keeps reminding these teenagers that he is, uses 90% of his brain function but still can't do anything to them. He's failed multiple times and admits mm-hmm. to it, and he's just like, I'll get you, Teen Titans. Like, he's, he's, he's pathetic. <laughs> and I would have gotten away with it if it hadn't been yes. those pesky kids. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. he's a that was my villain. initial thoughts on him. I was like, this guy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, he was outgunned no matter what against. Mm. I mean, you got Starfire, who's by herself, just even though she wasn't very, she wasn't exactly trained, but she right. was powerful. So, yes. yeah. yeah, he was he was outpowered. I'd say he's a sad. Well, old it's kind of like it was the. That's like a rubber stamp. I mean, just looking at the cover, right? Mm-hmm. You have Ravager there as the featured character on the mm-hmm. cover, and Deathstroke's half shadowed in the background but mm-hmm. ravager doesn't make it out of this issue and deathstroke's going to be there f- until modern times right. right right so it's just it's just kind of odd but uh, to me the character is pretty well the same character now as he is at, at this point you know it's like the, right. that idea of him never giving up on a, a on a, a bounty whenever he mm-hmm. gets assigned to it and you know, the 90% of the brain. And going back to that, you know, r- at storytelling at this point, and we've seen this, like, in, like, Wolverine, where, like, there's always, you know, if you're reading X-Men at this time or New Teen Titans, and they always have to do something to introduce the character right. because they're written assuming that this is going to be, be your first issue. First Absolutely, book. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, whereas now they just write for trades, you know, so they don't, they either put the text at the front right. of each issue to tell you where we're at in the story but before they would do that introduction 
in the story. So it's like, you know, that's that's why it's something to give the reader yeah. you know, that impression about what this character is about. But when you read them all together, so you go, like, I get it, I get it, you're smart, I whatever. Get it, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you want to, if you want to see, if you want to see the worst example of this, read like the first five or ten appearances of um, Iron Fist, because it's like every single one, and his fist becomes like that of iron. <laughs> it's like it's constant. It's like oh my gosh, it's so bad. <laughs> what was uh, what was up with the fact that he's obviously Deathstroke, Deathstroke the Terminator? Uh, he's introduced at the very beginning as that, and then. The only other time in the first five is technically in the X Men crossover that they call him Deathstroke the Terminator. He's just the Terminator after that. What was the point of that? Does there do they ever say like why Deathstroke is dropped? And then obviously I get like when the Terminator movies get big, they probably drop the Terminator for sake of not confusing things and he gets called Deathstroke then. Mm-hmm. But it's just so it's a weird thing that they give him these two names and then only use one of them. That's a good question. I can't tell you without nope, digging either. up maybe yeah. a one of, you know a, a back issues magazine and see if there's an article about that right. somewhere or maybe I've got a I've got a couple of reference books about the Titans and George Perez but you're right. I mean it's not very often you see a, a character with the um, sh- you know Shad the shenanigan guy. Yeah. You know it's a it's just <laughs> one or the other the shenanigan guy or Shad. Right. Exactly. And um. But they, it's yeah. So they did say the Terminator quite a bit, but later on, it's all Deathstroke. I That's mean, what I remember. Yeah, even the titles of his mm-hmm. of his solo books. And he's yeah, never had re- he's never had a solo book that was just called the Terminator. It's always right. been Deathstroke or Deathstroke, Deathstroke the Terminator. Terminator. Yes, right. yeah, right, yeah. Kind of makes you wonder who gave him the name. Even I mean, it's yeah. I, again, there's so many stories. I never read anything about him outside of New Teen Titans. What year did this come out? 80. 80. Well, the first was it 80? In, in 1980, yeah. And then what year did the Terminator movie come out? Oh, I think they were in. That's that 82? In. 84. 84, okay. 84. Terminator. Okay, all right. So this actually does predate mm-hmm. the Terminator. Yeah. Okay, all right. You know, because there are, there are like, uh, I know, especially, like, with Claremont, you know, he wanted to do an alien story, you know, so he incorporated the brood into X-Men. I thought, well, I wonder if this is oh, Mark yeah. Wolfman wanting mm-hmm. to do his own Terminator, but no, it, it's not, it's not the case, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Let's see. All right, so, what, uh. Sorry, I lost my notes here. I gotta, I gotta switch back. To Adam, so, <laughs> so how closely do you feel that this character compares now to how it was, how he was when he was introduced? I'd, Mike, I'm gonna let you go first. <sighs> let's Chad go first because I want to think about my answer a little. Okay, bit. all right. The all only Chad, thing I can think of is age. I, I feel like they've played with his age. Not in the, he's always. I feel like been older, but. Mm-hmm. Maybe not this old. I don't know how old he is, but they, I mean, he's full, full white, but that doesn't mean anything necessarily. But I put him at 60, let's just say, here in this book. Mm-hmm. And I feel like they've played with him anywhere from 40 to 60 and maybe beyond. Uh, you know, even I think the going to the Arrow TV show, I would, I think the uh, whatever his name was that played him was probably in his mid 30s, late 30s. Uh, so I think probably age is the biggest thing I've seen difference in comics uh, and on the screen. I, for me, I mean, it, I'll just feed off of what you talked about the age wise is he's definitely been like an elder villain or elder yeah. mercenary. It, it, older, but not necessarily obviously decrepit. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, like in like, okay, not to, do anything too much about new 52 but like that was like one of the sticks in new 52 his first issue it's like you know he he builds this team to go on this mission and it's like he's the best at what he does kind of like a wolverine thing and at the end of the issue he kills all these young pups that he brought in along with him just to prove that he's the best you know so he they've they've kind of had some pretty big swings and then you know later on he's more the Mm anti-hero right where he not quite Punisher, but he's like he's not always doing bad. But they'll 
they'll bring him in to fight Batman, or they've even powered him up to go up against Superman at times. So it's it's kind of been all over the place. Um, I, I don't I don't read a lot of Deathstroke. I read a lot of the Christopher Priest run uh, in Rebirth. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was a pretty good run. Uh, after you know, after Priest left it, I think I just that took that as my excuse to drop off. But uh, and then, well, that's yeah. So I mean, there's been a lot of changes, and his power level has fluctuated. But that ninety percent has always stuck around there. So, yeah. Yeah. Mike, what do you got? Well, just so I had a little bit of point of reference on current, or at least more current stories, I had this, hmm. and I had the first three volumes of the Rebirth era of Deathstroke. And I was reading, I'd, like I said earlier, the only thing I ever read with him was the Teen Titans, and I just remembered Identity Crisis. He played a significant role, mm. defeated a large portion, not not your Batman and Superman Wonder Woman, but he beat all the B-tier Justice Leaguers pretty handily. Um, yeah, that's a story I have not read. <laughs> you haven't? I have not read Identity Crisis. Oh, well then, Okay. We need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. Well, it's yeah. So anyway, uh, but I. Yeah, I'm a Marvel guy. Shad's an independent guy. You know, we, that's yeah. why we haven't read Identity Crisis. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, it's it's a Brad Meltzer book. Anyway, so the what I'm reading so far and what I know of him in subsequent years is that he is pretty much the same. Except I think when you get Priest involved, you get so many layers of character development and. One thing about Priest, he does a lot of time jumps in his stories, and it can get <laughs> confusing, and it's worth a couple reads because it is quality stuff. I've read half of this first volume just to be a little bit prepared, but essentially it's the same. One thing I do know about the, the gray hair shad you mentioned yeah, is that I think for the most of his existence, at some point they said that happened artificially. That didn't. He just uh, wasn't okay. old. It's just that he had some something happen that his hair turned gray. Gotcha. Now, is he old enough to have adult uh, characters, adult superheroes and supervillains? Yeah, he had mm-hmm. he had Ravager. Grant Wilson yeah. was Grant Wilson probably you know at least 18 years old. Right. And then later on, I don't know if you've ever heard of Jericho. He was a mm-hmm. uh, deaf-mute superhero that could occupy other people's bodies, and he mm-hmm. joined... The during the Judas Titans, contract. During the Judas contract. Oh, okay. He was also a son of Will mm-hmm. of Deathstroke. And then, of mm-hmm. course, he had his uh, daughter, daughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rose Wilson, later on, that was introduced somewhere. I, it was, I she was reading. also Ravager, right? Yes, yeah, she, she became also, Ravager. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So it's not that he, that he was like, he wasn't contemporary of, in age, He he, but he wasn't 60. So... It was I just gotcha. something happened to turn his hair hair white, I guess. Yeah. I I always put him in the the forty five to fifty range, yeah. kind of is where gotcha. I kind of fed yeah. because he he definitely was intended to be older than sure the other heroes and especially obviously the Teen Titans. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So, uh, Shad, you got any moments in the first five issues that you'd like yeah. to call any special attention to? Uh, I was a big fan of the scene in, in issue 10 where there he's uh, presenting the Project Prometheus to the bitters. And uh, the hive end up killing all the bitters. And the way the Teen Titans ended up faking <laughs> their death in the explosion uh, with the bomb. Uh, I just thought that was like really good storytelling for them to kind of recap how they faked the the atomic bomb landing that he had that he had stolen instead of using the Project Prometheus bomb and uh, and that whole just interaction in that issue was was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Any other moments you want to call out, Chad? That's the only one I wrote down. <laughs> okay, okay. That's, that's that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Mike, what about you? What do you, what do you got? What do you? Oh, want to call you know out? me. I've got. I I make lots of little tidbit moments. I, All right, I, I'm gonna put you on a 30 minute timer. Okay, go. 30, 30 minutes. Minute. We'll make it 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Wintergreen <laughs> is a great character. He's mm-hmm. basically the Alfred to, and yeah. he's it's just just the idea that you've got a basically a manservant that is not necessarily a good guy. He's just the evil version or not so good version of Alfred. I love that about him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I think that uh, I, I like the idea. I had forgotten about this until I read it again, but the puppeteer was one of the, the villains in issue nine working for Hive, and the puppeteer mm-hmm. was the first 
villain that Green Lantern ever faced, at least in his own run. I don't know who he faced in, you know, uh, Showcase 22 or whatever, but uh, in Green Lantern number one, Puppeteer was the villain, and you can figure out from the name what he did. (laughs) And... But one of the things that it's what is the I haven't read Judas Contract since the first time I really haven't, and I know that's that's hard to believe. But reading parts of it here in these Deathstroke issues is like I cannot wait to get my hands. I've got the the trade that covers you know that storyline. And like Scott said earlier, that is one of those classic storylines. And watching the the development of Terra Markov from the, you know, innocent younger teen, like 16 years old, and just in between issues from the beginning of 34 to the end of 39, it's like the more you knew that she was actually evil, Mm -hmm. the more her features that were not, that were kind of represented her inner ugliness came out like her her teeth become mm-hmm. like her teeth became more prominent her front teeth it was just mm-hmm. you know that scene where she's got the the cigarette holder and the or, makeup and and mm-hmm. then the whole infamous scene of her being supposedly 16 years old in a bathrobe well, mm-hmm. and you're like i don't know if you're to you know to, in, to imply from that that there's a romantic relationship between mm-hmm. her and this however old 45 year old guy yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's always been the subject of a lot of, um, you know, uh, it's controversial, and mm-hmm. and I agree. But I, I now I'm like I need to really dissect this when I get a chance and see. And of course, the lead in from issue 39. You've seen the cover, you guys. The, the one of those classic quit covers. What issue of uh, Spider-Man is that where he quit? That was famous, Scott. Do you remember? Uh, Fifty. I th- no, 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 no. Shoot. Because 50 was the first kingpin. Was it 50? Yeah. I know. I, I should never ask you these things because I don't mean to. But, I mean, those classic, those quit, quit covers are really cool. Mm-hmm. And that's what this is with Wally West and Dick it Grayson. Is 50. Okay, are you, talking about the, are you talking about the one where it's like the, the he's walking towards the... The, he's walking towards the front of the book, and you got the the back of Spider Man. Yes, at yes. the back. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, that's yep. a, that is Amazing Spider Man fifty. So okay. I did have that yes. correct. Yep. So. Uh, anyway, you know the cover was great on that issue, and again, you know, uh, this you got the added benefit of reading these Deathstroke issues of of reading about the the new Teen Titans when around the twenties, thirties, and forties of that run was really when they were peaking and some mm-hmm. of the best stories were in that in that era so mm-hmm. it makes you want to go back and read the whole Dagum run again and yes i said Dagum. yeah <laughs> well well like all of my moments are kind of tied since judas contract was my introduction to this character it's like the surprises you know that you <laughs> kind of reading them in the wrong order oh yeah you know kind mm-hmm. of brings you so it's like okay so you know, I the the fact that there that Deathstroke had this previous history because of the death of his son, and he blames the Titans for the death of Grant. I didn't even know Grant existed. Whenever I'm reading Judas, oh contract, yeah, that right? makes sense. There was just I just knew about Jericho being the son, and I knew about you know Rose later on down the road, but I didn't know that there was this that something that caused that animosity to exist between Deathstroke and him blaming. Mm-hmm. Uh, Right, so that was that was that was really like kind of like this big surprise for me, and really the 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 biggest surprise. And and Mike, you kind of hit on this already. Again, going back to Judas contract, I thought Tara being the double knot spy, right, mm-hmm. was revealed in Judas contract. But now I find out that the reader, you know, that goes all the way back, you know, almost a year. Before oh, okay. the Judas contract, that the reader knows that that's going on, that that's going to happen at some point, yeah. and you and the Titans don't know, so it's really, I was surprised whenever I, or I remember being vaguely surprised when she turns traitor in in Judas contract, but if I had read these in the correct order, 
it wouldn't have been a surprise at all, right? I don't, right. I don't know. I don't know which way is better. <laughs> I don't know if it would have been better as the reader to have known going in or, or to have that surprise moment yeah. where one of the good guys turns into the bad guy, you know, right mm-hmm. there at an important point. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, and I like I like how you explained that, you know, about the infamous, and I, I – I'm convinced that he did have a physical relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's smoke smoking cigarettes, and I, you wonder if her voice is changing. And- yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just it is it, it, to be though. To be honest, so I was like I said, I was at this point. Let's see, I was maybe 17, uh, 16, 17. I did not. It didn't click back then. I didn't. I don't know. I, but now, as you get mm-hmm. older, you're like, whoa, hold the phone something's mm-hmm. not right here and yeah I'm, I'm interested now to do some research and read some you know some stuff about yeah. it <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm gonna choose not to comment any further on the real that relationship yeah yeah <laughs> you know that's what i say you need to say something and you could just get yourself in trouble talking about it too much you know <laughs> so here's one last comment i have scott and chad <laughs> okay okay so i didn't remember this from back then either but mm-hmm. when you know she had these contact lenses that recorded that took photos mm-hmm. or video or whatever and that's how she was figuring out when they finally the team accepted her and they revealed all their secrets they gave their secret identities mm-hmm. to her and you got deathstroke and wintergreen back here to back eating their you know their chips and and dip and just you're enjoying that oh yeah that's so that who he that's who mm-hmm. robin is i'm wondering did they ever capitalize or talk about if they figured out that dick grayson was robin Mm. that would have led to bruce wayne being Mm -hmm. batman and that would have been even a bigger thing and i just don't remember if that ever got explored you know i mean in rebirth there was that deathstroke like who is damian wayne's father storyline i i i think it's been man it's been a little bit since i've read that because I was that was part of that Christopher Priest run, I think, mm-hmm. when it crossed over with Batman. I they I feel like Deathstroke knew Bruce Wayne was Batman. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I I, it could I, be. I, I it think could be. so. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. It, it I, might I, even be in. It might even be an identity crisis. Uh, okay. There might be some, but now, like uh, my first thing I'm going to do when we get off the phone today or get off this call, I'm going to go look up the Who's Who entry <laughs> on Deathstroke, <laughs> and I'll go from there. <laughs> Okay, I think it's very telling, though, that, you know, this is the first five on Deathstroke, and I feel like we spend as much time talking about Tara Markov as we <laughs> have talking about Deathstroke. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just, uh, I don't know what that says about this character. Is he, maybe it's just because he, he feels a little generic, right? I mean, he's just yeah. a bad guy. He's got a little strength. He's a little fast. He carries a sword. He's got a cool look, you know, but... But um, he, at this time, I think he, his... The benefit you get from a character like that is that he makes other characters look good. No. Yeah. And now later on, like a, like we said, the under Priest and some other writers, maybe mm-hmm. he 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 he's got the he's got the strength to carry the book himself. Mm-hmm. With a good writer. With yeah. a good writer, like yeah. like with any character. Any character, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. So, all right. Uh, any other moments you want to, you know, call out for these stories? Mm-hmm. I mean, th- there's no, I, th- I think I covered pretty much everything through okay. this is there's, there's a lot right. to talk about, but it's mostly teen Titan stuff that I okay. jotted down. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Shad out of these five, which is your favorite issue? Uh, I'd say 34 funny enough because of the finding out about Tara. I like, and, and you just said that we talked about Tara a lot, but uh, and I'd, we're on our third plan on how he can put, potentially kill the Teen Titans, and but that introduction mm-hmm. uh, of Terra in there was like, oh, I really like where this is going. Yeah. It finally, it felt like we were actually seeing a Deathstroke story that was developing into something bigger versus, but previously it was like kind of a one shot. He was just in there to drop in as the villain of the month, kind of a thing in the book. Uh, and this was like, oh, he's going to be around for a bit once that kind of kicked in. Yeah, right, cool. Chad, if you if that is your favorite moment and you have not read Judas Contract, 
you should go ahead and read Judas. That's contract. actually on the next question. Well, the like, what what are you going to read it next? The Judas contract is my. I've always wanted to read it. I own it, but I just have never read it. So. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Good. I just wanted to. I just wanted to make for sure. So yeah. So. Um, okay, Mike. You got a favorite story from these five? Well, Thirty-four. Even though they are five issues apart, they're still the the main thrust of uh, the main storyline or whatever is the same. And I guess in some ways I could say 34 because that's where you do sor- sort of first figure out that she's not the <laughs> altruistic, you know, yeah. teen hero. Uh, okay. But 39, I'm going to have to give it to that just for that classic quit cover. And, you know, it was, it was a good, okay. You know, it was, it was like a, it was the climax of that, 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 that prologue storyline leading to Judas contract. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to agree with Shad on that one in 34, I think is the, is the best. And, and again, it's because I guess maybe Deathstroke is, I think Mike, I think you might've said this is he's better as a, not the featured character, but the support character, you know, Mm -hmm. I think that he can, he can help move a story along. Yeah. Um, but maybe not feature him too much again, yeah. unless it's a uh, something that's clearly written. So, yeah. so sad. You've already said that you're planning on seeking out or making it a point to read Jude's Absolutely. contract. Um, either of you guys, as a general rule, are you going to seek out uh, stories with this character? You know, moving forward, or what? What are your thoughts moving on about Deathstroke? Absolutely, for me. I mean, I'm, I'm going to start with this rebirth. Uh, three volumes. The first few, vi- first three volumes of it. And I might fill in some gaps if I want to go back in time, but I'm definitely going to learn more about the more, uh, you know, up-to-date version of Deathstroke. Anything to add on that, Chad? I don't, yeah, just Judas Contract as the, and especially as you guys are like, Judas Contract, Judas Contract. I was like, all right, I, it's time. I probably should read it soon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, for me, it's it's always going to be on a character like this. If I hear that there is an excellent story arc, and I guess I'm hearing that Identity Crisis is something I might want to consider reading, I'd probably seek that out. Um, but there'd have to be like a somebody I consider a master craftsman as the writer for me to go actually start buying a Deathstroke book on a monthly basis. So, yeah. All right. Closing thoughts on first five for Deathstroke? It was enjoyable. It was a good... Yeah. Call back for me to go back all those years to my teenage years and reread these books. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I'm glad that we chose chose uh, that character. Yeah. Me too. All right. So I think we're going to let Chad once again uh, introduce our trivia segment here. We're going to once again go from the next set of questions from Blood Moon Comics. Mm-hmm. Comic book trivia, <laughs> and see if Mike and I can do as well as we did last time. So, all right, you ready? Oh, I am not ready. But all right, I, I'm pretty sure that this is where we <laughs> left off. Uh, so, question number one: Who temporary filled filled the thing's role on Fantastic Four <laughs> after the events of Secret Wars? I'm gonna do well, a uh, what's his name off. Welcome back, Cotter. Uh, <laughs> Horshack. Horshack, yeah. <laughs> All right, I will. I will give you the floor on this one. <laughs> and I, to be fair, I would have known this one. Okay. Even if you anyway. hadn't said it earlier, but it would be She-Hulk. Yeah. That is so. Hilarious. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> what is the What is the likelihood like that that would six degrees of Kevin Bacon? Yeah. So. That's wild. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. Who is the inhuman Atelian? At- Atelian? Uh, who can? Le- I think it's Adelan. Adelan. Who can level a city yeah. with only his voice? Wow, <laughs> that's another one. This looks this looks rigged. I know a little does, bit. Yeah. Oh my god! I, I I assume you know the answer to this, uh, Mike. I mean, I, do I lo- do we lose if I give the wrong answer and you get it we'll, right? Uh, we'll confirm. No, okay. we'll confirm. I will. I will confirm. Your <laughs> well, I mean, if we're so. talking about the voice powers, it's got to be Black Bolt, right? Mm-hmm. I will confirm your answer. <laughs> there. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. We're two. All good. right. You ready for this one? <laughs> What's the name of okay. Barry Allen's nephew, the Third Flash? <laughs> okay. So far, three for three characters we've already absolutely talked in about this episode. This episode. <laughs> yeah. That would be Wally West. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. 
All right. Um, okay. I, no, did, not that anybody would believe us. I, we swear. We swear that we have did not plan that at all. Holy well, smokes. and <laughs> if if you did do the extra credit and read the crossover uh, Uncanny X-Men and Teen Titans, what is Shadowcat's real name? Oh, my gosh. Well, that is Kate Pride, but... Uh, but uh, yeah, okay. Are we, Mike, did you have? Did you yeah, have I, I would have known that too. But <laughs> okay, all right. Because yeah. like you know, from being adjacent to conversations of that, I've never. I don't think I've ever read her as Shadowcat. I just know that she had lots of different identities over the years and costumes. Mm-hmm. Yep. It, the one, uh, j- just to, as a side note, the Kitty Pride and Wolverine story. Mm-hmm. It's a six issue series. It's a pretty good story. Um, it's 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 kind of where she it, she has that shadow cat identity in there. It's also where she becomes really becomes a a fighter. Gotcha. You know, she was just kind of a phaser before that, and Wolverine mm-hmm. uh, really turns her into a fighter during that. So really, just basically turns her into a ninja. So all right, so all right, you're sorry. right. Yes. Past yes. this, so the the back half of this not going to be as uh, on topic. Uh, Okay, good. So, <laughs> question number five. In which city is Savage Dragon a police officer? Oh, what's sad is I read the first issue of Savage Dragon not too terribly long ago. <laughs> and I hmm. don't remember. And... Mm. It's got to be... It, I don't know that it's... I'm trying to think if it's a real city or if it's a... If it's a fictional city, I don't know. Do you? If it's real, I had a guess, but I don't know. It's just yeah. I this is one of those. If I had like four choices, I'm certain I could pull out choice, the correct. Yeah. I could pull out the correct one, but I don't think it's a real city. Okay. I think it's a. I think it's a fictional city, and I think it literally has city in the name, but I do not remember at all i i don't know i'm not and i'm not gonna drag it Atch, if it was a real city what's your I guess i was gonna say detroit i was gonna say cleveland if it was a real city it is a real city yeah. it is a real city it okay. is neither of those uh let me give okay, you a multiple right. choice I'll, I'll make one up for you okay. so we've got uh seattle san francisco chicago and philadelphia Okay, I guess they wouldn't obviously, but I'm gonna go with Phil. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with Philadelphia. Okay. I don't think he was West Coast. Actually, you got a you got a guess on the multiple choice. I can't imagine him being a, a character. I don't know. I can't remember what, what the character is <laughs> like, but I can't imagine so him he's being. A, too... He's a big. Green he's a dragon. Guy, yeah, I know. Right, so... With a fin down his head. <laughs> <laughs> Written and drawn by Eric Larson, first appearance in graphic. You know what, Eric Larson one. is is he's pretty freewheeling liberal guy. I'm gonna say Seattle. You both would be wrong. It's Chicago. Chicago. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh God, we live in the dark state where Chicago is, <laughs> yeah. and didn't get that right. Okay. All right. All right. So number six, which original member of the Justice League is based out of Coast City? Scott knows okay. this. I know, but let Scott have this one. No, I don't want to embarrass myself if I get it wrong. So I know you oh. know it, so I'm going to defer. Okay, it would be Green Lantern, Hal Jordan. You got extra credit even on that. You didn't even need the Hal Jordan. So there you go. <laughs> uh, was that what you were going to say, Scott? You know, I hadn't a fit, I hadn't really thought it through yet. I probably would have been talking still about it if I was the one that was forced <laughs> to give my first first answer. I'd probably be going, okay, no, okay, so Superman. Uh, Fair enough. You know, Green Green Arrow, Star City, uh, and then like who's left? Oh. <laughs> I wouldn't have got it that quickly okay. for sure. So number seven, this one is probably the hardest one on here, I think. So who built the original Shockers gauntlets? Wow, <laughs> that is a tough. Yeah. that is a tough question. So that so Shocker shows up in Amazing Spider-Man forty one. Okay. 41 it's early so i mean we have to go with somebody like okay so there's not a whole lot of i mean there's not this massive spider-man 
uh, rogues gallery at that right. point. Yeah. So I'm trying to think who all was around at that time. I don't know. I'm like trying to come yeah, up who with could have answer. actually built it. Yeah. And I'm trying to. I'm actually. I'm actually trying to remember this villain's name. So I'm like, I, who I'm, would be I'm, an inventor? You who know, would be an inventive it, hero? Yeah. You know, because there was like uh, the fixer, but I don't. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have been him. There was the okay. I want to go, and I think this is the correct name, but I want to go with the Tinkerer, Mike, but I'm like 25% confident on that answer. So I'm not confident in it at all. It's better than me saying the Toy Man. That'd be wrong company. Okay. Do you... Uh, <laughs> all right, we'll go with, yeah. we'll go the, with tinker? the Tinker. Okay. Then. Uh, before before that, do you do you remember who the first Shocker was? The original Shocker? Do you remember who that, who that character's name was? I do not remember what the okay. character's name oh, right gotcha. now. Because that would have been the actual answer. Would have been the the first shocker was the person who built the the first shocker's gauntlets. Oh, <laughs> who is? So he built really? his he built his own. It's Herman Schultz. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> oh, darn. Hmm. I okay. like Tinker better. Yeah. I'm gonna rewrite that there story. There you go. <laughs> All right, and then <laughs> this one once again, listeners, not rigged. This character was once known as Galen, a space explorer who gained cosmic powers. <laughs> do you want this one, Mike? Do you no, want me to take it? I want it? you to do it. You do the honors. Okay, so that is Galactus. Yes, it is. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> this is very on theme wow. this week. Or this, yeah. That was, oh, man. All right, we got to move on because everybody thinks that was rigged. So we got to move past that. So I'm busting, I'm busting out the CLG. There you go, shake. do it. And oh, I got a good one this time. So we have Black Panther Volume Four, Issue Number Two. Would anybody, anybody here know the significance of this issue? Extra bonus the trivia: Death question. of T'Chaka. Volume Four. Volume Four, Issue Number Two, written by Reginald Hudlin. Penciled mm. by John Ramita Jr. I don't know. Did anybody know? Nope. Okay. I well, I, which character? I believe. Were? I believe this is the first appearance of Shuri. Oh, uh, I was gonna guess uh, Black that. Panthers, that was, uh, but Black I didn't Panthers know where, when her first. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's one of the few that I could name. You know, as <laughs> yeah. far as a supporting character. Yeah, so that is why, if I'm remembering correctly, apologies if I am not. That is why, why this book is in my collection. All right. So first appearance of Shuri. So hot dog. All right. Yeah. I'll, so, all right, who's I'll next? shake it up. Shad's going. Uh, it is Beyond the Breach number one. Uh, this was a book that came out like three years ago from Aftershock, uh, written by Ed Brisson. Uh, artist is Damien Cusirio. I, I messed that name up for sure. Uh, but it was a. I actually was looking through my collection just the other day and saw this. I was like, I want to reread that. Uh, it was about this like this breach. Uh, kind of a, a crossover between uh, our world and another world uh, and, and all these alien characters kind of came through and took over the planet and this woman that meets this small child and then there's this little alien character and they go on a little adventure trying to escape from these big bad aliens. So uh, it's pretty good. It's like a five issue mini series. How long was the series? I think it's five. It five. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh. My turn. <laughs> and it's your turn. You're the we're the only one that's left. <laughs> okay, let's get the old specs. Oh, this is an oldie, and I can't say I've ever read it, but this is Brave and the Bold number eleven. This is pre team up, oh, pre Justice Brave and the Bold. League. That's pre Justice League, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's okay. uh, 19, wow. 1957, April, written by. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's more than one story, but the main creators are Robert Kaniger and the artist. Russ Heath, which is just amazing, but it features on the cover of The Silent Night, um, and then there's also stories of the Viking Prince and Robin Hood. So, oh. did you say The Silent Night, or the sh did you mean The Shining Night? No, The Silent Night. That's a whole oh, other okay. character. Yeah. Okay. All right. And guess what his gimmick is? He doesn't talk. Uh, he doesn't talk. Yeah, he's kind of like Black Bolt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See it all. It all it ties all together. Back, yeah. It all connects back. So because yeah. we talked about Black Panther right. as the next issues after, man, <laughs> that, that's uh, yeah. Okay. But Viking Prince is all. I mean, those are like uh, they were the. I'd say until I don't know when the first 
sort of like showcase type issue was for Brave and the Bold, but it wasn't until the 20s. So, okay, yeah. Right. So, Shad, do we know what's going to be happening on episode 100? Yeah, 188. We're going to be covering the uh, Lunar Next Phase catalog as well as all the other pre order catalogs that exist out there in the wild. Okay, and Mike, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, beside podcasts at bergcomics.com, where might they do that at? Well, it's going to be at Mike at Mike's Comic Shop Roadshow.com. Nice. And Shad, what uh, about you're going to you? find me at shadschubert.com with all the links to all the fun stuff. That's S H A A D S C H U B E R T.com. And I'm Scott Reed. You can find me at bergcomics.com, B U R G comics.com, with links to my social media pages and eBay store. And we'll be back soon with next time. I'm trying to remember, you know, I'm trying, I wish I remember what episode it was where we had the gun, the gunshot. Oh, yeah. Know, when Dan and I were recording. Uh-huh. That would be like a good mark, you know, figuring out where that was. <laughs> yeah. Is it pre-gunfire or post-gunfire? <laughs> oh, my God, that's right. I, that wasn't too long before I came on. Again. Yeah. Okay. Holy <laughs> moly. I'd almost forgotten about that. <laughs> it actually went through the window, right? Didn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we found, we found the bullet fragment. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was crazy. It's like, I, I ran up and, like, we were just sat myself there and I was like, I can't remember if it was me or Dan. One of us finally said, I think that was a bullet or a gunshot. <laughs> Like, I, it's like, oh I started to just like keep going. I was like, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> if that's gunfire, I probably should like not be sitting here in front right. of We should probably stop <laughs> and go in the back room. So, so we go to the back room. Make sure the door's like go in the back room for like call the cops. Like, I'm like, come on, one. I'm like, I think a bullet just went through. <laughs> <laughs> so we got there a couple of minutes later and like I was on the phone with 911, wait for them to pull up and we unlocked the door, let them in. And we found the box where the bullet had gone through and pieces of fragment on the, there's a little piece of glass up on the comic rack. And, <laughs> and then after the cops left, I'm like, Dan, you want to go ahead and record? And Dan's like, I don't think I want to record. <laughs> So we played the audio where the where the for the cops where the bullet came to the window. Yeah. So I could hear it. <laughs> That's crazy. And, and apparently we called the cops before the person who got shot called the cops. Oh shoot. <laughs> oh, so they, they actually had a victim in the shooting. Well, yeah, it, it was it was like the you know like the I guess it'd be the um 13 eastbound. It's like across the road over there. It was like oh, way wow. over. It just happened to arch through. Oh the... yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know um, a, a guy, a retired judge in town. I know him just as a family friend, and I fix his computer once in a while. But on New Year's Eve. He had a bullet come through his picture window in his living room. Luckily, he and his wife weren't sitting on the couch because mm-hmm. it went through the wind, through the glass, and into through a, a plaster wall, and then hit the Ooh. refrigerator on the other side of the wall and dropped mm-hmm. down. But it was the trajectory looked like it was like quite the arc. So it was just people on New Year's mm-hmm. Eve popping off. Yeah, because wow. this one didn't even like it made it through like the corner of a couple of comic boxes. Yeah, and then before it wasn't able to like get through the next box. Well, I'd like to get the comic box. I don't. I, 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 I think like Mike that. saved it. Well, Mike saved it for a while, you know, <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah, I gotta find that the audio sometime. Was that just you and Dan recording that night? Just Dan and I recording that night, so yeah. I don't remember what all it was what it's about, so yeah. from, the lesson I learned from the first time we did the dual recording was to mute both sources of, of my mic or both mics when I want to clear my throat. Oh I yeah, yeah. Without doing that on that. I listened to that first episode, I'm like, oh, oh my lord, that's, <laughs> that's terrible. But yeah. Push the button or get a better headset. Well, I've got the button and I, got, I just had to remember to do more than just the Skype recording. But this should take care of your mic, period. Oh, it'll do all of it, eh? Eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea why I said hey. <laughs> it was a little out of character, but I liked it. Yeah. I know exactly why I, I know exactly why I said hoser. So. <laughs> Take off, eh? Hey. Okay. You betcha. You betcha. That's, that's Wisconsin. That's not Canada. So. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. All right. So. Uh, all right. So, I'm actually recording both Skype. We got all our recordings going. Mm-hmm. Anybody else got anything else we want to talk about? I don't think so. Oh, I should show these here. I'll show these real quick if I can find them. I did get two sketches. Oh. And I'll probably talk about them in the podcast, but I'll go ahead and show you, the, show you the, what they look like. Ugh. I can reach them. So one of the guys that was there did a variant cover for Rom at IDW, uh-huh. so I was able to get a Rom space sketch. That's cool, yeah. Right. That's a very good idea. Yeah, and then now this is a pretty simple one, but it has. This is gonna be my main story for whenever we get into the podcast. My Carl Kiesel sketch. Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's bouncing boy. <laughs> oh wow. Now I wish I would have done something like that. I got lucky, and like I'll tell I'll, I'll tell the whole story in the podcast. So you guys will have to listen to it twice. So. Okay. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do you a favor. I'll make you listen to me tell the same story two times. <laughs> And my intro is really stupid this time, just before Warren. I'm playing off. I'm playing off the the weird FF48 issue okay. for our intro. Okay, so I just so hopefully it'll make sense after you hear it. So. <laughs> <laughs>